Hello, everyone. The conversation around guns in America is a challenging one. Those who support gun safety legislation and self-proclaimed defenders of the Second Amendment often find themselves divided on the role guns should or shouldn't play in our lives. But gun violence isn't a problem that's likely to go away soon. More Americans died of gun-related injuries in 2021 than any other year on record. That's according to data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. That includes both murders and suicides involving guns. Now, most Americans want some form of gun control. According to a CNN poll from last month, 64% of people support stricter gun laws. Why then is it so hard to get anything done when it comes to gun legislation? And how do we move a stalled conversation forward? Well, let's start with some definitions. Jennifer, the video we saw focused on mass shootings, but how do you define gun violence? Yeah, I think this is <laughs> not a million dollar question, a billion dollar question in terms of what gun violence is. I think starting the conversation by really wrapping our heads around the enormity of the problem and the complexity of the problem is really the first step. Um, so, you know, when we watch like the video we just watched, when we watch news coverage, typically it's mass shootings that receive so much of the coverage of the public outpouring of sympathy, of the material, the financial financial support. We know the stories of the victims. We know not just the loss that they represented to their families, their friends, their community, but also the futures that we all lost um, as members of society that, um, you know, I think of um, Carmen Shentrup, one of the victims in Parkland, whose dream was to cure ALS. My father died of ALS. Um, these are real losses. Unfortunately, though, the problem is not that we know these stories and that we're covering and talking about and, and really processing the trauma of what these um, gun violence survivors and victims and their families and communities are going through. It's that mass shootings are actually a very small proportion of gun violence. When we look at who is killed by guns every year, it's somewhere between 45 to 50,000. The majority are suicides. Uh, the people who are most impacted by gun suicides are white rural middle-aged men. When we look at gun homicides, which are not half, but that those numbers are actually creeping up in terms of the total number of, of gun deaths, um, we see that African Americans are 12 times as likely to be killed by guns than white Americans, which obviously does not um, resonate with the images of gun violence survivors that we often see in the context of mass shootings. Um, and we can peel that down even to gun violence exposure. So when we think about gun violence, you know, the numbers are so over overwhelming when we just talk about gun deaths. We often don't even get to have the conversation about who gets shot and survive or who is a witness to gun violence. So we know that witnessing gun violence among children, for example, um, has gone up since uh, 2020. About one in five kids witnesses gun violence. Um, the disparities in terms of race are egregious. More than four times, uh, it's more than four times likely for a black child to witness gun violence than a white child. And when we look at the impact of just witnessing gun violence, that impacts PTSD symptoms, um, reading and math abilities, um, educational achievement well beyond the, the, you know, the immediate event of witnessing, um, lifetime health outcomes. Um, so, you know, it's really hard to actually kind of contain this problem because when you start pulling one thread, you see that it's actually so much more than even the huge statistics that we often get overwhelmed by. Representative McBath, your son Jordan died in a 2012 shooting, and that's part of what inspired you to run for Congress. His death was more than a decade ago, but how much has changed? since you first started advocating for gun safety legislation. Well, thank you for that question, and most definitely, I did decide to run for Congress because I was very acutely aware um, that the message was being lost. No one was crying out for the loss of life, for the carnage. Um, and so the fact that I, a woman of color, who ran on a policy of gun safety is my number one policy agenda in my candidacy in Ruby Red, Georgia, and I won. So yes, things are changing. And things are changing because no one wants to be me. No one ever wants to be a victim. No one ever wants to be a survivor of gun violence. And so we understand the confines of gun violence is it, it's, it has expanded. 
It's in the suburbs. It's in our schools. It's in our churches. It's everywhere. And so people have just decided now that they are looking for gun sense champions. They're looking for state legislators. They're looking for federal <coughs> legislators. They're looking for leaders to stand up and to be concerned and care about preserving their lives and their ability to be able to live in this country unfettered with the fear of unnecessary gun violence. So yes, things are changing. There are uh, a larger number of individuals and in movement building and people such as myself, such as survivors and advocates that are on the ground that are making great strides in the movement towards gun violence prevention. Organizations such as Every Town for Gun Safety, Sandy Hook Promise, all of these organizations, Brady, they're all collaborating together. The movement is growing. We have more gun sense champions now that have been elected to federal office. They are now my colleagues. We see that, on, we see that also in the state legislatures. We see that our governors across the country now are starting to move and have special uh, sessions on gun safety legislation. So yes, we are making great strides, but this this is a slow process. We're looking at a public health crisis that has been evolving over years. It is a cultural crisis that we're dealing with, and it will take time to dismantle this cultural crisis. But yes, things are changing. But as we heard from Jennifer, we so often have this conversation through the lens of mass shootings. And Clark and John, I want to hear from both of you on this. How is the conversation we have around mass shootings different from the conversation we have around everyday violence? Clark and then John. Yeah, thank you. Um, there's, as a parent, and I have two small kids, there's nothing that I can think of that's more horrific than the idea of, of, of someone coming into your kid's school with a gun and, and, and shooting innocent children. And that happens far too often in this country. There's no question about it. Um, the reasons why it happens are not well understood. I understand that probably most people in this audience believe that a significant part of it is access to guns. It's certainly a conversation that we can have. But no sane person goes into any um, environment and, and, and murders innocent people. It's, 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 it's very obviously at least partly a mental health problem, which is something that has to be addressed. Um, as Jennifer pointed out, more than half of all gun deaths are from suicide. That's also a mental health issue. And I think the question ultimately is this. Um, if you want to be effective at changing policy, and I suspect most of everybody in this room does, um, you have a choice. You, you, you can either engage with people who don't already agree with you and try to get them on board with whatever policy proposals you have, um, or you can express disdain for them and, and, and their position. The idea that anybody would need a gun, for example, is, is a common narrative. Um, I would just share a couple of points. One is, um, when you uh, make points that um, set off people who disagree with you, let's say, you know, really enthusiastic gun supporters, I'm not in that camp, but I'm adjacent and I know people who are, a factoid like more people died in 2021 from gun violence than any year on record, it is true, but it's also a bit misleading. We actually have a lower rate of gun deaths in this country than we did in 1973. Why? Because the population has gotten much higher. So yes, there have been more total people dead, dead from guns, but still a lower rate. Um, and believe it or not, the rate of gun deaths for the last 50 years has been declining. Um, we've had a bad couple of years, uh, absolutely, uh, associated with COVID, but a lot of metrics have gone up in those years. Um, you can check those facts out yourself, please do. Um, at the same time that gun ownership has been increasing and the ease with which people can carry guns in public, more than half of the states in this country now, you don't even need a license to carry guns in public. Um, and yet the rate of gun deaths has gone down. Um, again, you can check these facts out yourself, don't take my word for it. But if you don't know these things, um, I can guarantee you that people who support gun rights, they do. If you don't know, for example, the name Elijah Dickin, you should know that name because they do. Um, he was a man, 22-year-old 22 22-year-old 22 man who stopped a mass shooting uh, at a mall in Indiana one year ago um, and, and saved an incalculable number of people. Um, I'm not here to try to persuade you to embrace um, a more supportive attitude towards guns. I'm really not. What I am here to do is to say that if you want to make a difference on policy, it's important to know what people who disagree with you believe and where they are right and where they are wrong. They're not right about everything. They're definitely wrong about some things, but so are you. 
and it's important if you want to engage to have to be able to have a constructive conversation um, where, you're, where you're operating on the basis of facts um, and, and not emotion. And I think that um, we can certainly improve the policy environment, but not if we remain polarized. And that's going to continue to happen if we're not having a conversation and if we're instead just throwing rocks back and forth, which I see too much of now. John, I, I saw you have a visceral reaction there. No, 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 I, I just, you know, I think we often talk about how polarized this issue is, and, and I, I'm not sure it's as polarized as we caricature it is, and I think about a couple of things. I think about Lucy, who one of my heroes, there's no question about it, and I can remember the day she called me up and said, I'm going to run for Congress, and I gulped, and she said, why are you hesitating? And I said, because you, I know where you live. You live in New Gingrich's old district in the suburbs of Atlanta, and you're going into a three-way Democratic primary, and if you by any chance win that, you're going to have to unseat an incumbent Republican who's associated with both Trump and the NRA. Mm -hmm. And Lucy said, stop gulping, I'm running. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> and she won in a district that nobody thought she could win in. No Democratic committee. <laughs> Support, no Democratic committee supported her, none, even though I begged them to. Um, uh, and so I think, I think that's just one example of why this issue isn't so uh, polarized as we think. The other example I would give is one year ago this week, uh, we passed in Congress, Lucy, a big part of this, uh, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Uh, it was the first major uh, bill to be passed in Congress on gun safety in 26 years, uh, essentially in a generation. It was a substantive bill, but what's so striking about it, and this goes back to your question, what's changed? You know, in the days after Sandy Hook, uh, there was a very moderate bill put on the Senate floor. Uh, it was a background check bill. It had substantial giveaways to the NRA, which I feel guilty about because I wrote some of them. Uh, and uh, it w had a dream team of co-sponsors, a Republican NRA A-rated or Democrat NRA A-rated, and it failed with virtually every Republican voting against it and a handful of Democrats voting against it. Ten years later, we pass a bill uh, with every Democrat on it and 15 Republicans on it, including Mitch McConnell, Lindsey Graham, uh, John Cornyn, who actually negotiated. And so when you say, you know, is America so divided on this issue? Well, a lot less so than we think. Uh, have things changed tremendously if you look at the days after Sandy Hook to the days after Buffalo and Uvalde? And that's because the political calculus has changed significantly. Uh, politicians read polls. There's overwhelming support for background checks, overwhelming support for red flag laws, overwhelming support for... Uh, making sure that domestic abusers don't get guns. And there's no question about it. Uh, Mitch McConnell, when he said to John Cornyn, I need a bill, I can't go into the midterms after Uvalde and Buffalo opposing gun safety legislation, it was because he recognized that the public has changed significantly on this issue. Jennifer, I want to circle back to something Clark said. And it, it makes me wonder if we are only focused on the initial moment of violence and not the secondary and tertiary effects of that violence. Is, is that part of where this conversation breaks down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, identifying where the conversation breaks down is a huge question. Um, you know, I want to actually go back, I want to start with this question of how polarized are we? I think that that is, so I'm, I'm a sociologist, and so what that means is I spend a lot of time thinking about things like culture, thinking about how guns matter to people, how guns impact people, above and beyond the sort of baseline public health and criminological outcomes. So I've spent my career talking to, interviewing, um, you know, engaging with gun sellers, gun law enforcement, uh, gun owners, gun carriers, gun violence survivors, gun victim, violence victims. Um, and so, you know, I think when we talk about this question of polarization, 
I think you can kind of find whatever you want to be, whatever you want to look for, you can find. Uh, there are, we are polarized. We are polarized on some metrics. And I don't think um, pretending that we're not, um, not that you're doing that, but I think, I think we do have to, we, that's part of this terrain. That's part of what it makes, you know, makes it a quote unquote wicked problem. On the other hand, we are, um, we do have, um, you know, overwhelming consensus on background check reform, on opposition to banning handguns outright. Um, and actually, if we look at that consensus, it doesn't always line up with one side versus the other side of the gun debate. Um, I think that that's where, you know, when we think about facts and we think about, you know, if people would just listen to the facts, I think it's, you, you can find on both sides of the gun, the gun debate an endless number of examples of people saying, like, if only people would listen to the facts, we could solve this. And, you know, I think that it, when, when we think that we, if only we had this simple solution, I think that's a flag that the solution obviously is, is not that simple. Um, I think it's also a flag that we need to think about what the facts are doing and what, how facts actually matter in this debate. And so to get to this question of, you know, where the conversation breaks down, I think that in some ways, both sides sort of weaponize facts in ways that, um, at least as it feels on the other side, undermines their sense of being valued as um, equal member of the conversation, as a citizen in this society, as, um, as a human being. And I think that actually so much of this debate is turns on our ability or inability to see each other as intertwined in a political debate that is more complex, that goes beyond any one of our individual experiences and recognizing that we don't have the full story. And so I think sometimes, you know, when we think about mass shootings and we have this massive coverage, we have a two week time span and then, you know, the trauma fatigue, you know, sets in, we go on to the news story and we don't talk about, for example, the fact that most of us in this room will know someone or be directly impacted by gun violence over the course of our lifetime. And, you know, depending on what room we're in, we will have very different responses to that. Some of us will, you know, join the cause of gun violence prevention and, you know, really push to, to, to change policy in terms of, um, you know, strengthening gun restrictions. Some of us will buy a gun because that is the most immediate, logical, solution in the context that we're in. And I think, you know, sometimes when we, when we take this like mile high view of, you know, what are the facts and how, you know, kind of really sort of try and get some traction by looking at the big picture, we miss these fine grained ways that can really trip us up in the conversation and really make it impossible to see that we are honestly all struggling with a context that we did not choose. None of us put into place the structures that, that have guaranteed that we now live in a society where there are more guns than people. Gun violence, regardless of the rate changes, is too high. Um, and where we are grappling with to, to, for solutions that um, are very, very difficult to grasp. But so. don't you think that sometimes the problem is we're having the wrong debate? We're talking yes. about... Mm -hmm. You know, we shouldn't be having a debate about a referendum on gun ownership. That's mm -hmm. not really the issue. The yes. issue is really about safety and what makes you safety. Because what Americans, I think, all can agree on is they want to be, they want freedom from fear. Nobody wants, we all have, I have kids too. Uh, I, nobody wants to think that, you know, when they s send their kid off to school in the morning that they're going to meet them in the emergency room rather than at the soccer game. Nobody wants to think I have teenage kids that when they go to the mall, they're actually taking a risk when they're trying on dungarees. I don't think anybody says dungarees. <laughs> uh, excuse me. Uh, but I think, I think we really have to reset what the conversation is about. And when we have this debate about is gun ownership, I think that's when people go to their corners. But that's not what we should be really talking about. We should be talking about safety. Well, yes. Representative McBath, I, I want you to take us inside Congress. Because so often what I hear is a disconnect between what the public is talking about and what actually happens among lawmakers. Where, where is that disconnect as, as you've experienced it? I actually think you'd be very surprised to know uh, and a, a lot of times there are these discussions, organic discussions that we have one-on-one. -on -one. <clears throat> and of course, those are never talked about in the media. And we actually do work together. Oftentimes that's not talked about in the media as well. But if you have these organic one-on-one -on -one discussions and relationships with my Republican colleagues, which I do, 
You'll be very surprised to know that some of them are saying, yes, absolutely. We have a public health crisis on our hands. We have a crisis here that we know something has to be done about it. But we know that this discussion and this policy agenda has become so extreme, there's so much extremism, that we can't go outside the confines of our party and be the pariah to stand firmly against what's happening in the country. We can't go against our own party. And yes, I've had discussions with my Republican colleagues that recognize we have a public health crisis. <laughs> but so, Representative McBath, I just want to jump in here because you said these aren't conversations that are reported by the media. In some ways, they're not reported by because the media. I think sometimes we're not privy to them. Right. And, and part of what gets lost is the public's ability to be a part of those conversations, right. right? To be privy to those conversations, to know that those conversations are actually happening so they feel less disempowered. So mm -hmm. how do we shift that? How do we make those conversations part of the public discourse? Absolutely, I think the thing that we have to understand, this is not just about mass shootings. This is about everyday gun violence as well. We're talking about suicides, people that are in crisis who have access to guns, and the family members have been imploring law enforcement or someone, don't sell this, my individual, my loved one, a gun, and they're committing suicide. This is about children who have access to unsecured firearms in their homes. This is about women that are dying in vast numbers by their domestic abusers. The number one way that they're dying in the country is by guns. So this is, let's talk about organically about the holistic policy of gun violence prevention. It's not just mass shootings. And so that is what we have to continue to talk about, finding the solutions, the solutions, federal background checks for all gun sales, red flag laws so that people that are in crisis, they can be identified and law enforcement has the tools to be able to help those family members take those guns away from those individuals until it's ascertained that they're no longer a risk to themselves or anyone else in the community making sure that children don't have access to unsecured firearms, making sure that you know, we're protecting women's rights and abilities to be able to live freely without the unfettered access, I mean, unfettered fear of gun violence. This is an organic, holistic way to really stem this divisive, ugly culture of gun violence. It is a public health crisis. So this is how we have to approach this. It's not just policy from the policymakers. Of course, we can't do it all. We cannot do it all. I can't get my Republican colleagues in Washington to sign on my discharge petitions that I put forth in Washington uh, just a few weeks ago. We had a discharge petition on the assault weapons ban, background checks, and also closing the Charleston loophole. Not a one of them signed on. So we are depending on our organizations like Every Town for Gun Safety, Sandy Hook Promise, Brady. We are depending on advocates and we're depending on survivors like myself to help move the needle. That is truly the most holistic, organic way to solve this crisis. I, I do want to talk about gun ownership. According to a 2020 Gallup poll, 32% of U.S. adults say they own a gun, while 44% say there are firearms in their household. According to that same poll, 50% of Republicans said they own guns compared to 18% of Democrats. So although gun ownership rates are higher among Republicans, there is, there is some nuance there. And I'd like to hear, Clark, first from you, what do you think we miss when we treat that ownership debate as a binary? Yeah, I, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record. It's very clear what my role on this panel is, and I will embrace it. Uh, <laughs> listen, I couldn't agree more that, that if there's going to be improvement here, it's got to be through the democratic process. And I implore you again to stop pushing away people whose agreement you'll ultimately need um, to, to, to reach those democratic compromises. There are a lot of things, as Jennifer pointed out, um, and John, that, that there can be agreement on. But I want to make just a couple of points really quickly. Um, as a sort of an emissary from the pro-gun ownership camp, I'll say a few things. Um, first of all, they would have been horrified. People who support gun rights, support gun ownership, gun ownership would have been horrified by that video for one simple reason. With one exception, every pro-gun person in that video was a clown and a caricature. 
especially Trump. Um, and they're used to that kind of rhetoric where, where through subtle ways, their side is, is depicted as less and wrong and bad. Um, and on this issue of whether there's a lot of agreement, unfortunately, there's not. There's a lot of agreement on really easy things like background checks, like red flag laws. But the three most important and, and challenging issues are, in my view, who can own a gun? For example, if you have a felony conviction like Martha Stewart, does she not get to go own a gun the rest of her life? Um, or, and then where can you, what kind of gun can you have? High capacity magazines, so-called assault weapons. Um, I'm not gonna say what I think you all think, but I know a lot of people who are on, for example, the, the sort of progressive side of this issue, they would absolutely ban those things tomorrow if they could. Um, and people who support, fair enough, fair enough. But then let's have a candid discussion about that. Come out and say it, right? Um, and the third point is, where can you take that gun? Um, there's a lot of litigation in the Supreme Court now over what constitutes a sensitive place. In other words, where you can't take a gun, a church. Well, guess what? There have been some mass shootings at churches that were stopped by ordinary citizens who had a gun and were able to shoot that shooter. It does happen. Um, it happened last week in Las Vegas. Were you aware of that? There was somebody who was trying to get into an apartment building with a tactical helmet and an AR-15, and he was shot by a private citizen. You're not aware of that, are you? Because it's not being reported. But go look. You'll find it. It happened last week. Um, I'm not here to try to make the case for gun ownership. I know that would be futile. What I am trying to make the case for is um, if you want to have democratic agreement, if you want to have improvements in policy, um, you have to engage with the other side. You have to know what they think and you have to know what their concerns are. And their concerns are you really are trying to take away some of the guns that they feel strongly about owning. And um, if that's true, then say it. If it's not true, then let's have an honest discussion. Can I interject on that you know, just for a second? Briefly, and then I'll come to you, John. Okay. Uh -huh. I'd like to interject. There's an organization, 97% run by Matthew Lippman. And this is what they do all day long. They survey law-abiding gun owners, conservative gun owners. And we work very closely with them in Washington. Um, I, my office works very closely with them. And they can actually show you the information, the statistics, the empirical data, that this is all that they do is survey these gun owners who absolutely say that they're closer to the 97% of Americans in this country that know that we have a public health crisis with gun violence in this country. And, and, and we are having those discussions with them. The problem is, is just getting them to step outside the confines of the extremism to actually engage in helping find solutions. Yeah, it's just really quickly, let me say there's extremism on both, there, there is extremism on both sides. Let's yeah, be clear let me, let me yep. bring John here. And so I'll, I was just going to say, look, we're talking a lot about laws, and laws are important, but you would be the first to say, this is a complicated problem, and laws are not going to solve this entirely, and I think we should keep that in mind. Yep. Uh, the truth is that the industry can do more to make guns safer. We're not talking about getting rid of guns or stop manufacturing guns, but there are, there are innovations. Palm print recognition would make guns safer so only the rightful owner could actually fire the gun. Uh, Reweighting the uh, trigger of a gun could actually present, prevent two-year-olds from actually being able to discharge a gun accidentally. Individual responsibility about safe storage. We know so often that teenagers who uh, commit suicide are getting their guns from their parents uh, who negligently store their gun, leave it on the dining room table, leave it on the bedside table. We know that guns often get into the black market by auto theft, breaking into autos or burglaries. And how are they getting them? They're getting them actually because they're negligently stored. That doesn't take a law. That takes just behavior change of people understanding individual responsibility. Uh, we clearly need more Lucy McBeth. Uh, you know, people should be running for office and, and actually um, making this a priority. But we should also be investing in communities. Uh, the truth is that Lucy was behind that major bill that I referred to before that's giving huge amounts of money to communities for gun violence interruption programs that are showing promise. So I think we just make a mistake when we just debate mm -hmm. the laws. Yeah. And, and Jennifer, I want to come back to you here because I think it's, it's showing up in this conversation, but where, where do we get stuck? Right, because we can, we can talk about 
data, yeah. we can talk about laws, um, we can talk about those secondary and tertiary impacts on kids. I, if anyone isn't familiar with him, John Woodrow Cox's uh, research and reporting on this is phenomenal on how kids are being affected by gun violence or even the possibility of gun violence when we talk about um, school shooting drills. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. we, we did a show after Uvalde and in the midst of that conversation where we hear from a lot of listeners, they message us. During that conversation, we got a message from a mother who said she just gotten a text from her daughter saying we're on lockdown, mm -hmm. I love you in the midst of that conversation. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's something undergirding <laughs> this conversation that it seems like we just have trouble getting to. What is it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, again, I feel like every question you ask, there's like five different profound answers that I wanna give you. So let me give you this one, which is, I do wanna go back to this um, emphasis on seeing one another as human beings and remembering that we are vulnerable, that we are fearful, and that that's okay to be part of this conversation. I think that, you know, we definitely saw this with COVID where, you know, I think there was that, that split second where we all thought like, oh, we're going to all join together and we're going to say, you know, this is something that affects all of us and, you know, we're going to band together and get through this pandemic. And that is absolutely not what happened. We divided into our camps. We were fearful. We were buying all the toilet paper we could buy and we were um yeah we really were showing who we were um i think in many ways and i think that oftentimes that's what we act out every time we we have this fierce debate about guns so i think you know one it, and you know it's one thing to be like see one another as human beings i think one step or one path to doing that is to actually remember the power that we have as fellow citizens to engage one another. So one of the things that I think is really powerful, um, you know, that was brought up with regard to community violence intervention programs, these similar, similar sort of programs also um, exist with regard to suicide. And it's getting people who, for example, in the context of community violence intervention, who may um, have former gang affiliation, they have some expertise in how violence works. They are on the front lines actually working to interrupt gun violence to stop the cycle of retribution. Um, we also see this in the context of suicide where gun sellers are actually being trained to recognize signs of suicide so that they as credible messengers you know not law enforcement not a therapist but someone that can just stop and say do you really want to buy this gun right now um, and that's actually you know been effective I think the community violence intervention programs are showing a lot more promise in that regard and so I think what we need to remember is that we also all get to be credible messengers. And so thinking about what is the context, who are the people that we can engage, you know, when we, when we have this conversation about like, oh, we need to, you know, we need to talk across the aisle. Why aren't politicians doing it? Why aren't we doing it? Why, what is our barrier? And I think if we actually spend some time processing that in our own lives and thinking about what we need to do to see one another in, you know, in our circle, I think that's a first step for really sort of moving this conversation in a direction where, um, you know, we're not just waiting for the powers that be to pass a law or repeal a law or give us what we want in terms of the policy world, but we're actually rebuilding that civic culture from the ground up, and which I think is a huge piece of why this debate is so stuck. And part of what I hear you describing are programs that don't require laws no to be put no. in place yeah and i think also yeah it's thinking outside the box of gun policy and thinking outside the box of you know oftentimes in this conversation we even saw it in the video this reference of like you know why doesn't the u.s look like this other country in terms of gun policy and there are so many reasons why that is but i think flipping the script and asking what is it about the u.s that compels us to have the kinds of gun culture the kinds of gun violence what we have in this country um actually puts both the onus back on ourselves, but also empowers us in a way that just focusing on policy doesn't do. Representative Patel? Yes, I just wanted to say that, you know, there is a lot of really good work that is being done on the ground in communities all over this nation for community violence intervention and interrupters. The thing is, is they're underfunded, they're understaffed. And so what we've been able to do with the bipartisan safer communities law that John talked about is actually to fund those organizations that are doing this really good work of breaking the cycles of violence at the foundation 
nation. That's what we have to do. That's part of this discussion as well. What are the foundational reasons why we have so much violence in our communities? And my colleagues and I, Stephen uh, Horsford from Nevada, we've actually uh, put forth a piece of legislation called Break the Cycle of Violence that would actually secure $650 billion for organizations around the nation that would actually begin to work at the ground level, the platform, the basis of breaking the cycles of violence, which are all, always, we know, parts of the larger problem that we have with gun violence. So these are the things that are working. These are the things that we're trying to do. And I think those are discussions that we have to have. Find in, uh, organizations within your, in your own communities that are already doing this work. Invest your time and your talent there because that is also a way to be viol viably a part of gun violence prevention. John, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you over your years working with every town what you've had to adjust or shift in your approach to this issue. What have you learned? Well, look, I've learned, uh, you know, I'm a bit addicted to data and I don't want to rattle off data, but, you know, I think that I've watched the American public move on certain issues. I mean, I got criticized 10 years ago uh, for not uh, supporting an assault weapons ban. People thought, you know, that I was too moderate, that I was too sort of trying to sort of put my finger up and test the winds. But the truth is that I didn't see public support for an assault weapons ban. That's changed tremendously, actually. Uh, uh, and 10 states now actually have assault weapons ban. And I think next year it will be 13 states. And, you know, 10 may seem small, but that's 20% of uh, the states in this country. And so I see a s significant amount of movement. But I think that from the very beginning, what I knew I didn't want to do was make this a debate about gun ownership. I, I think that that is just what divides people. Uh, you know, I think that people uh, should f enjoy gun ownership for hunting, for sport. There are certainly people who feel anxiety and nervousness about their own security and by guns. But I think what there is agreement about is keeping us safe. And uh, I think that's where we have to focus. Um, and that's done through laws. It's done through engaging an industry. It's done through individual conversations, person to person, school board to school board, church to church. Uh, and I think what um, I have realized was that in, in some sense, and, and I'm not, wasn't an expert at this, was the movement of people is as important as engaging politicians. If you can organize people, and, and Lucy, this is how I met Lucy, was through m m when she became a volunteer for Moms to Man Action, uh, which is a part of every town, and we now have 10 million, over 10 million supporters. And I think in many ways, their one-to-one -one conversations uh, move the needle uh, as much as legislation moves the needle. I'd love to hear from each of you where you see the possibility for a shift in how we talk about this issue, um, and how we and how we address it is there a, a specific area where you say there's an opportunity right there I'll come to you first Clark well I you know I don't want to rain on the parade but the answer is no I don't think so because I think I think we are deeply polarized on this issue very much it reminds me of abortion actually um, you know as a constitutional lawyer I'm very aware of the case that came down um, I think that issue is just not one that's capable of being totally bridged because I think people have very strong convictions on either side. Um, I think the same is true here, and I'll just give you one very concrete example. We've talked about safety, safety, safety. Of course, everybody believes that we want to be safer. We want everybody. I want my kids to be safer. No question about it. But there is, I think, an, an unbridgeable disagreement about what that entails because some people think the best way to make us safer is to restrict gun access, restrict gun ownership, restrict where people can take those guns and that's not a crazy position by any stretch and I see you nodding and I get it. But there are other people who feel just as strongly that gun safety or, or safety entails them being able to have a gun with them where they think they might need it in a shopping mall, in a school, wherever it may be. And just one last point. 
If you haven't familiarized yourself with the question of defensive gun uses, this is a sociological term for when people use a gun to stop a crime, to stop an attack, it is one of the most studied issues in this area, and I think many of you will be shocked, shocked at the amount of agreement among credible criminologists, including ones who hate guns, uh, about what the range is in terms of how often guns are used to save a life, to prevent an attack, to stop a crime. We, we've only got a, about a minute and a half, and I want to make sure I hear from everyone, but very, very briefly, in just a sentence or two, Clark, what I hear you talking about, though, is something, is addressing this through a policy lens, and beyond policy, do you think there's a, a point of opportunity to shift this? Yes, I do. I think if we can have a more candid discussion about what people's anxieties and fears are, which are perfectly valid on both sides, and what people's willingness to compromise are, to say, you know what, we give up assault weapons, you give up, stop, stop trying to take away high-capacity magazines, something like that. If that discussion can begin, which it, I don't think it has, then I think we could get somewhere. Representative McBath. Mine is very, very simple, because this is what I say all the time. You as a law-abiding law gun owner, Hunter, I respect your right to, to shoot, to hunt, all those things, but help me to help you, the law-abiding gun owner, never ever have to feel like you have to use your guns to protect yourselves. Help me to help you feel safe in your own communities, in your own homes. Help me to do that. Help me to help protect you in such a way that you don't ever feel like you need to use your guns. We're only trying to keep guns out of the hands of individuals that should not have them. People that are in crisis emotionally or behaviorally, people that have criminal intent and people that have been convicted of crimes with guns, domestic abusers, people that are possibly going to you know, cause harm to themselves or others if they're in crisis. Help me to help you, the law-abiding gun owner, feel safe in your own communities so that you never feel like you have to use a firearm. John, where do you see an opportunity? Focus on the industry. Uh, cars were once made of tin. They're not anymore. People used to smoke in every uh, street corner. They don't anymore. The Sacklers used to have their name on every museum in the United States. <laughs> They don't anymore. Uh, the industry has to take some responsibility for this. This is not about saying, put them out of business. This is about making a safer product. Jennifer, you get the last word. Okay, so I think we've all been talking about how we need to find spaces where we can straddle political divides, straddle, straddle political worlds. Um, in 2020 and 2021, there was a massive surge in gun purchasing. There were millions of first-time gun owners, people who were more likely to be racialized minorities, sexualized minorities, women, liberals, all people who broke the quote-unquote stereotype of the American gun owner. Talk to them. Jennifer Carlson is a sociologist and a professor at the University of Arizona. Her new book is Merchants of the Right, Gun Sellers in the Crisis of American Democracy. John Feinblatt is president of Everytown for Gun Safety. And Clark Neely is senior vice president for legal studies at the Cato Institute. And of course, Congresswoman Lucy McBath. She's a Democrat representing Georgia's seventh congressional district. Thanks to you all and thank you. <laughs>